Hello, everyone. Mariposa Young here. So, <clears throat> I am really excited to share my kind of my bibliography, as it as it were. Like, how do I know what I know for divination and spirituality and um, I think as someone who does readings professionally, who does um, spiritual counseling um, professionally, who does um, teaching of <clears throat> divination and magic professionally, I think that the least I can do is explain to you how I know what I know and where I got that information from. And I just realized I forgot something really important. Well, we'll just run with it. You'll probably do it on here. Anyway, any who. <laughs> so let's get into it. How do I know what I know? Where did I learn it from? So <clears throat> probably the, and I, I'm really sorry. I have like <clears throat> some congestion in my throat. Uh, the most profound learning that I had was from my family. My grandmother and my mother did readings for other people for money. My grandmother did magical spell work for money for other people at a time where that was like super no no. So she was doing it on a down low. Can you imagine? I'm very much in admiration of my grandmother. And <coughs> My grandmother learned this from her mother and her grandmother and so on and so forth. So these are heirloom, generational uh, knowledge um, that is carried forward, mostly about divination. Um, my grandmother um, learned some magical stuff from her family, but most of what she was doing, she learned in her lifetime. So how that looks is, is that in my family system, even as a child, I was um, evaluated informally for talent and I passed those tests and so then my instruction occurred and it was regular, brief, fun, and, um, you know, occurred over a very long period of time. And um, it was also like I had the opportunity to witness them being professionals as well. And um, that normalized uh, readings in particular to me, like I thought that was normal. I thought everybody could do it. I, you know, it was not a weirdness for me. And I'm 50 years old. And so in my youth, while it was nothing like for my grandmother and not very much like for my mother, it was still kind of like, that was a little too weird, you know? But thankfully, mostly just weird. Not, uh, you know, I didn't uh, deal with um, much antagonism. Um, uh, luckily, so knock on wood. So, so I was really free to like continue 
to continue exploring and and figuring that out even into adulthood, uh, returning to family to share and also to learn more that I couldn't learn in childhood, those kind of things. So most profound teacher for me is family. And you may or may not have had that kind of teaching. Um, if you did, I think that is like a rock solid foundation. Uh, if you didn't, I think that's okay. And there are different ways to um, get knowledge as well. So in adulthood, starting in young adulthood for me, uh, I just pretty much continuously had a teacher or a mentor um, teaching me something, something. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> to deepen my own knowledge, to enrich my own practice, and to deepen my spirituality. So um, I've had too many mentors and teachers in my life to name here. Um, gosh, many of them I've lost track with as well. and. Um, I will share that uh, um, like currently I don't have like a formal mentor or teacher, but I have, you know, like a handful of people that I follow their content and I learn from their content. And in some cases I've paid for that content. So to share uh with you those folks um and that was the part that i'm sad i didn't uh, bring my notes for that so let me i'm gonna bring up something on my computer so i can make sure i don't forget anyone it will be tragical um I'm going to look here. So, um, okay, that's really good. Okay. So lately I have been getting into um, astrology pretty deeply. And I really like uh, the astrology podcast. Um, and Chris Brennan heads that up. Austin Kopic is also on there. Um, I also like Donna Stellhorn, and she incorporates a lot of Chinese astrology. And <laughs> she's also like um, the astrology podcast is a huge fan of the whole sign system for astrology. And um, Donna really does not like that system, that house system. Um, and I mentioned that because I really like different perspectives on anything I'm doing. And then I make up my own mind. <laughs> and also I try out different things as well, which I love to do. Okay. Then, uh, James Von Prague, Van Prague, I always want to say Von Prague, Van Prague. He was one of the first mediums I saw on TV <laughs> when I was a young adult. And so I continue to follow him. He's really um, got a lot of great stuff on YouTube right now. Um, and so I don't have to wait for super or try and find super old reruns. So he's a great one. And his realm is mediumship. Um, I really love uh, Lady Speech Sankofa. She is just a magical delight. You should avail yourself to her wisdom. Um, to their wisdom. Anyway, she's a 
just all over the place. I really love her stuff on TikTok, actually. Um, <clears throat> then I'm part of a spiritual community, and I really love the stuff that is shared by other oracles in there, which is Kamakshi and Angel Starseed. Um, Angel Starseed is in a, a voice alchemist. And if you could tell with me continually clearing my throat, it's an area that I am working on, <laughs> not just in my body, but spiritually. And then Kamakshi is really into herbalism and plants and um, yeah, stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's uh, really amazing the work she does with um, like um, having you guide your own discoveries. So I really like that. So that is the handful that I am following right now. And of course, you know, over the years, those, those, that my fandom sort of shifts. Oh, let me bring up also for astrology, um, sparkles of gold, uh, Nicholas, I'm not going to butcher his last name. Anyway, he's really good too. Sparkles of gold. Big on um, YouTube. Um, so anyway, who I'm learning from or following, um, kind of, you know, some uh, mentors or teachers last longer than other ones. And there's like a flow and then, you know, I find new ones and um, I'd really like to find a good scrying teacher, for example, right now, that would be like my next thing to look into. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, here's the thing. It's really, really, really normal to have many mentors or teachers or, you know, um, people you learn from. And, um, you know, sometimes that's like totally, you know, natural, like you've only signed up for a course that's like this long or, you know, like whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> And other times that can feel unnatural or involve conflict even, like you and that person, you know, have conflict and you break apart. And I have to say even that is pretty uh, normal. Um, so don't read into it that... I mean, don't like, you know, reject the subject matter or the content along with a teacher. Sometimes you have to move on to a different teacher. You outgrow your teachers. You have epiphanies about your teachers. And that even is part of your personal growth. And so it is okay to have those things come up to navigate those gracefully as you can and then move on, but hold on to all the content that you learned, okay? I even have that situation with my family. Um, you know, my family, well, I owe so much to them about what I know um, is hugely dysfunctional and <laughs> Having regular relationships with them is difficult. So, um, but that doesn't make me reject everything I learned about reading palms and reading cards and doing astrology and numerology and what have you along with that. Okay. I'm doing magic. I don't, I don't, I don't like throw out everything. Okay. 
And so you shouldn't do that with any teacher. You should hold on to the nuggets that were the most helpful and aligned for you. And um, um, it's best if you move forward intentionally and be like, I want to learn X, Y, Z, seek out teachers, um, <clears throat> thought leaders, whatever, and learn from them, okay? All right, all right. And then the last thing I wanna talk about, about experiential learning, which is the family learning and the learning from mentors and teachers, the best mentors and teachers I've ever had um, really gave me the opportunity, like even if it was like a lecture or YouTube video or whatever, I could take that and do something with it. I could apply that, I could practice that. So um, yeah, so the biggest piece to all that family learning or learning from other people is having practice. And even when I teach um, people, it's like half our time together is just pure practice, pure practice, just practice, practice, practice. Um, cause it's just that important. Um, so, you know, that means, uh, if you're a card reader or if you're learning how to do cards, you got to do card readings. And, um, I recommend, um, getting a bunch of decks and trying out different decks, trying out different spreads, um, having some kind of audience where you can practice with. You might not necessarily charge money, but you are getting practice. Um, and just the more is the better, you know, practice. I don't think practice makes perfect, but practice makes professional, that's for sure. And so I have a gazillion trillion no, I don't. I really had like my youngest counted them because he was like trying to get after me and tell me that I don't need any more decks. I think my current number of decks of cards, and this includes like Oracle cards and tarot cards is 16. So, and um, I just try to not buy some more. But it's really hard. <laughs> and um, I love to do, I love to try out new decks with, um, for like free rate reading sessions. But let me talk about some decks that really got me on my way, uh, let's say. And that is that uh, just plain old um, playing cards right? These look familiar, right? Uh -huh. There's a queen of hearts. This is a Texas cowboy themed one, but anyway, five of clubs. Is it five? Yeah, five. <laughs> Just regular playing cards. Why? Because, and this is called cardamancy when you use regular playing cards, because my grandmother and my great grandmother did not have access to a tarot deck. There were no metaphysical shops. You could like special order from a catalog, but you had to get a hold of a catalog. Even if you could order one, they were immensely expensive because this is still some, uh, I don't know. This is still some practice that is actually kind of fetish thing for aristocrats aristocrats here in America but also in Europe and my family were was the farthest away from aristocrats so um but playing cards are uh created from tarot deck um, you know, the four suits here come from the four suits in tarot, and they just only kept the Joker, which 
is the fool in the tarot uh, for the major arcana and um, and then just kept the four suits for playing cards. So they work. They still work. And philosophically, they're the same. And um, so my first learning how to read cards was with regular playing cards. And then my family does not follow the superstition that you can only be gifted decks and you cannot buy them for yourself because I don't know why anybody that was new to me <laughs> that that was an idea or whatever or superstition but anyway this is my oldest tarot deck the box has recently finally disintegrated so I got this card holder. Um, it's the Cosmic Tarot deck. I am not sure if it is still in print. I hope it is. It's a really old deck. And I got this when I was 17, 18. I got it for myself. Um, I got it because, here's the Prince of Cups. I got it because even though it kind of riffs on classic um, Rider Waite Smith deck, it um, still holds very true to the original. Here it is five of, or I'm sorry, eight of wands in symbolism, and that was important to me. Um, and also, like you know. Um, I never have owned a Rider Waite Smith deck because um, that yellow background irritates me. There's a yellow background on like all the cards. <laughs> so relatives had it. I've I've done readings with it. Blah blah blah. But I I just never wanted one myself. Anyway, this is. This is my oldest Oracle deck. This was actually gifted to me. This is no longer in print. I am like scared about that um, because I, if something happens to this, to replace it is gonna be horrendous. But anyway, I keep it in a Supergirl box and, but it is not Supergirl themed and it is the Secret Dakini Oracle deck. And it is tantric based. Um, the symbolism and everything comes from the from tantra, which is kind of like a sect or a, a flavor of Hinduism. So we have like Earthbound. I love that card. Um, attention. And it just uses collage. Uh, I think this was created in the 70s. Actually, this was created my birth year, 73. So me and this deck are the same age. But um, anyway, they used collage of images way before there was Photoshop and whatnot. So um, I love this deck. Um, and I couldn't even tell you how many readings I've done just with those two decks. I can't even tell you. And then the last card deck I'm gonna talk about is Talking to Heaven, uh, Mediumship Cards by James Von Prague. Um, I did a series on TikTok where I talked about each card individually. This has been a really great deck to kind of deepen my mediumship practice um, because I'm so familiar with cards that having card prompts that um, like help give you messages from loved ones. And they're all framed as if a loved one is speaking, like don't be afraid, right? Or see if I can get another one. It's not your fault. Um, 
those kind of things. So it was uh, a great leaping off point um, for my mediumship practice. Uh, <clears throat> I love books. I love books, period. Just full stop. I love books. <laughs> But I also love books that are like how to about uh, divination and other spiritual stuff. So um, this one was a revelation. So uh, probably my most talented area of divination is palmistry, palm reading. And I got this book in my 20s. I just found it. And um, I got it because I was going to be having a very fun time, like being like, that's wrong. That's not true. Da, 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 da. But what turned out was, is that a lot of my heirloom skills, my knowledge from generation to generation about palmistry was aligned with this book. So let's talk about this book. This book it was published in 1900 and Benham, this is the Benham Book of Palmistry. Benham was a gentleman researcher. He was uh, part of the British upper class and he had financial freedom to just be an explorer. So what he decided to do was to try and scientifically determine if palmistry was correct. So what he did was, and he did this for 20 years, what he did was he uh, followed uh, Roma readers, um, travelers, Romani, they, these folks go by many names, but they're usually on the edge of society giving readings. He followed uh, many practitioners and um, recorded the readings they gave somebody, um, did a ink print um, and later photography print of the palms of the people. Then talked to the reader and said, why you know, why did you interpret it this way? And they would say, well, because of this line or that line or whatever. And he was writing all this down and then he put it all in here. And then he followed up with those people that had readings to see if what was predicted came about. Um, his standard was 10 years. He would wait 10 years to follow up. And and then he was like, I'm only publishing things that were verified by the follow-up. And um, so I appreciate the scientific method being applied to palmistry. Um, because this is so old, it reads really, I mean, this is a really long book and it's pretty laborious to get through, but it's super in line with what I learned. So that was a clue for me because on my mother's side in particular, um, there's a lot of addiction. There is a lot of criminality, you know, like going way, way back. There is a lot of multiple marriages and lots of kids here and there. It's kind of a mess historically and genealogy wise to figure out. And I was always like, well, what palmistry tradition is this? But since my heirloom skills line up with this, I'm pretty sure it's from Roma tradition um, and that that's my tradition. And it may even be my ethnic, ethnic tradition. Um, so uh, this is a great book. So if you don't have the ability to come be my student for palmistry, this is a great place to start, especially if you have patience. Look how thick that is. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to clear the area once I talk about stuff. Um, 
So even though this author is problematic, this um, book, uh, Guide to Dream Symbols, and it's just like a dictionary. Like you can just look up a symbol and see what it means. Like, um, I don't like any of those. <laughs> Um, like drain pipe. Drain pipe is in here and it says symbolizes a need to discard spiritual excess or unnecessary aspect of one's life. Okay, drain pipe. Um, this uh, really helped me because so much of um, so much of magic, witchery, witchcraft has to do with employing symbols. Um, I really wanted to connect more deeply with my symbols, even in dream time. Um, so I use this for many years. And this book predates Google. You know what I mean? So before there was Google, we looked up in books. So that one is good. I say this author is problematic, though, because she's um, been accused of uh, being culturally appropriating of indigenous folks. And it's very, um, I mean, she deserves that criticism. Um, so that's another thing. Like, not all of your teachers are going to be unproblematic. All right, so numerology. Uh, numerology is great because there are a number of books out there on numerology, and I've never seen one that was like inaccurate or bad or like got me all riled up. So numerology is pretty steady and pretty coherent as a method of divination. Um, this is the book I got for my son because I could not find my personal book. <laughs> and I think it's just fine. But I think any book is really nice. This is the one I'm slogging through currently. Uh, crystal Balls and Crystal Bulls because uh, it's about scrying. And right now I'm working on learning scrying. And um, it's pretty good. It's very exercise, uh, full and rich. And I think that's the best for learning divination is you got to incorporate practice. This was my first book on my journey into um, practicing Wicca witchcraft. It's called Positive Magic, Occult Self-Help by Marion Weinstein. Maybe it's Weinstein. I don't know. Anyway, this is a great book. And she keeps updating it. Um, this is her original, so it's kind of old. Um, she does keep updating this book. I've peeked into the updates. I think they're great, too. Um, great. So she gets more into the philosophy of witchcraft in a positive light, like how to do positive magic versus negative magic. And um, so she gets pretty philo philosophical about it in the beginning and even a little bit historical. And then she deep dives into practical stuff, including divination and um, doing spell work and doing ceremony. So um, it's really, it's a really, really nice and kind of complete beginner book if you're interested in magic. Um, so that's it for exper experiential learning things. Um, Let's talk about some religious texts because religious texts.
texts are rich with spiritual technology. They really are. Um, and so they're worthy of our admiration, our exploration, those kind of things. That's what I think. So uh, I'm going to talk about the I Ching first. I, the I Ching is really, it is a method of divination. You can do sticks or you can do coins and you get hexagrams and uh, there's 64 possible hexagrams. And then you look it up and that gives you like a reading, right? Like, so 56 is the wanderer. And the hexagram looks like that. And it goes into like the judgment, the wonder, success through smallness, perseverance brings good luck, good fortune to the wanderer. And it goes on and on. This kind of reminds me of the fool. Um, it talks about particular lines and their importance. Um, yeah. It's, it's really, really nice. This is super duper old. Um, this method of divination predates, um, you know, it predates uh, a lot of things that occurred uh, at the beginning of Christianity, right? So it's pretty old. I am a fan of everything old. I love old things. The older, the better. And then we have The Magical Year uh, by um, Diane. Is it Diane? No, Diana Ferguson. This is an old book. I don't know if it's still in print. <laughs> but what it does is it goes through like all the Wiccan, traditional Wiccan, um, celebrations throughout the year and those usually follow the sun and the moon right the sun equinoxes the sun solstices the moon full moons the new moons uh, and the you know halfway point between all those um, those are things but what is great about this book is she's um, talking about a lot of um, myths from Europe that are tied to each holiday. So you get more of a religious context, but non-Christian, like predating Christianity perspective on um, a year of holidays. So this is a great one. I share this with my kids a lot because they do ceremony. We do family ceremonies. Um, and so to kind of give them some background. This book is a little bit new to me. This is not a new book. This is kind of a republishing of a refound, rediscovered, ancient text well not so much ancient but kind of from the time of alchemists right remember when alchemists were really popular but this is doing uh like how to do magic based on astrology and it's pretty comprehensive it is pretty long it is um it is it is readable, but I mean it's coming from very old English, and so <laughs> it's a slog. I I'm not gonna lie, it's a slog, but very interesting, very interesting, very informative for um, astro witches out there, which includes me. Then this I'm gonna say is. Uh, along with the magical year, kind of like a, an old classic, an old standard for Wiccans. This is particularly good for Wiccans. Uh, this is Spiral Dance by Starhawk. This is particularly good for Wiccans that do a lot of deity work, deity worship, deity um, 
calling in, uh, even channeling. Um, <clears throat> so it has a lot of invocations um, and devotions to different um, deities from mythology and pre-Christian times, along with advice on how to do spell work. Um, so it's it's really nice. It's really nice. And it's a classic. And you should check it out. Yeah, you should. <laughs> so along with my magical background and my uh, very magical family, uh, my mother rebelled and became a born again Christian. And so we went to Baptist church. Can you believe it? For uh, most of my childhood. And I don't know if you know this, but Baptists are very Bible centered and study the Bible. I recommend getting a study Bible because it has a lot of footnotes. Like, look at this. This part of the page is footnotes. This is the this is the stuff um, because the footnotes provide so much historical and historically accurate information about when it was written, who they were writing about, um, what was the contemporary politics and, um, you know, what, where were the boundaries in the, in the nations and the environment like um, at the time. So I think uh, knowing the Bible is actually super useful for a lot of different um, things, not just your own spiritual practice, but, um, you know, if you are a fan of literature, which I am, there are so many allusions in literature to the Bible. And so knowing your way around the Bible <laughs> or the Bible stories can really help uh, with um, decoding and understanding literature, for example, um, philosophy, you know, crazy people. If you can kind of find a way to like hook in, then we're really talking now instead of shouting, right? Um, and also, you know, there is value in here. There is some really great things in here. It's not all terrible. But you should find that out for yourself. Then we have the Bhagavad Gita. Um, I really like studying original texts um, of religious stuff. And this reads to me like mostly like poetry. And I love that. It is very um, easy to take in. It's very musical sounding. I imagine this makes great songs. Um, and philosophically, it's giving me a deeper understanding. This helps me with my Tantra-based deck, most of all. But um, yes. Then this guy. Ooh, he's embarrassed me recently. But... Um, been a fan for a long time. The Art of Happiness is not a terrible book to read. Um, it's pretty good. And along with his culture, we've got the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And again, you know, it's great to look at original source work and um, check it out. Um, this is pretty faithful, plus it has a lot of great illustrations um, to the original. So 
that's not all my religious books, but that's what I wanted to show you. And now I'd like to um, talk about the value of uh, being involved in organized religion, even Wiccan. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to go ahead and think that um, Wiccan covens, like that I was involved in in my 20s, were a form of organized religion because it was organized and it was a religion. So... <laughs> And I learned so much. So I would say that um, it is it is nice, and I have done this. This has informed my learning, is I have gone to different forms of worship and gone to their services and been in their buildings and did the things that um, they were doing. And sometimes I had wonderful religious experiences and sometimes I was like ick and you know both those experiences are really really valuable and religion that happens in community is a whole other magic okay and it's valuable and I think we are getting farther and farther away of from community so wherever you can find community i say go for it um <clears throat> let's move on to academic and fiction influences <laughs> first of all i'm a fan of fiction i read fiction every night before i can go to sleep <laughs> i used to read a lot of classical literature um, just for fun. And right now I'm on a, it's been uh, uh, about 15 years I've been doing this and I don't feel like stopping right now, but I've been on a kick of doing science fiction. But anyway, I love fiction and I used to teach English to high schoolers and I've taught fiction and I've taught literature and um, you know, storytelling can be very entertaining, of course, but it can be also instructive in implicit ways versus explicit ways that are still very valuable. So don't throw it out. Okay, so I really like this book. This is called The Precious Present. Spencer Johnson is kind of a Christian, I don't know, motivational speaker? I don't know. This has nothing about Christianity in it, by the way. It's a short story. It's very short, but it is really bringing home the moral lesson to be present in the present moment. And I love it. Then we have Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. I think this is a classic by now. I've read all of his books, by the way. Um, and he's getting at uh, some spiritual transformations through the path of a story. And it's beautiful. We have Ka, which is... And it, it's, is it fiction? I'm not sure. So it's kind of like true story telling us about all the pantheon of Hinduism, but keeping it central to Ka, which is the essential or first um, divine being. Um, and I just love this so, so much. I was so sad when I stopped reading it. And I've read it a few times now. You got to know your Greek classics. You just got to. <laughs> this is a Spark Notes one. This is one that I was like, I just want the down and dirty to remind me. You know, like sometimes I forget things. And um, so... I think this is valuable. Uh, my, 
eldest son is really into Greek and Roman mythology. Um, I got to keep up with him talking about that stuff. Uh, I love Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is the goat. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my gosh, it's a book mark from the Chinook bookshop, which I don't think even exists anymore. Yeah. Anyway, awesome, awesome books. Okay, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, The Mass of God, Occidental Mythology. We're this is like more academic-y kind of thing, but really examining the um, psychological and spiritual implications of myth. And myth is universal. It's universal. And it is foundational to just about any religious or spiritual practice, right? And then I love this book. It's Alice in Quantum Land by Robert Gilmore. Um, Alice in Wonderland is a favorite fiction book of mine. And then Alice in Quantum Land, if you are familiar with Alice in Wonderland, really helps explain quantum mechanics, which honestly, quantum mechanics explains a lot of spiritual technology way better than anything else, in my opinion. So this gives you a handle on quantum mechanics in a way that is quite digestible, okay? So I recommend it. And then this is my favorite book to have on the back of the toilet. <laughs> sure beats looking at my phone. So it's just like a dictionary, really, like a uh, volcano. Here, this page has volcano. Talking about any relevant symbolism, definitions, or myths associated with volcanoes. And um, this is really great for uh, spell work, to be quite frank, and exploring where your personal symbol making intersects with the symbols of the human collective. And then lastly, last category here, because I think meditation is super essential and important to doing divination, to being prepped for spiritual practice and et cetera and so forth. Um, I think meditation is super important. And um, Eckhart Tolle is the one that really got me, whoop, this upside down, really got me going with meditation in a way that um, I could do, okay? That I could wrap my head around literally and do it. Uh, we got the new earth. And honestly, this is his response to the um, kind of more, um, you know, Dolores Cannon uh, flavor of the new earth. And it's very sci-fi-ish and it's very um, doom and gloom, you know, and he's bringing it into like the new earth is in here in here and it's in here and it's in the human collective it is not outside of us it's not in our space it's not in the future it's like here and now and um i just really really love this book and recommend it and then we have the power of now this uh for me helped me um kind of see you know, like my whole experience of um, being on the earthly plane in a more um, 
conscious way, like paying attention to my spirit conscious way. <laughs> so I love it. And then because I love to write, I love to write. This is great. This is Writing Down the Bones by um, Natalie Goldberg. And she's she's a practicing Buddhist. And this is her instruction on how to become a better writer. And how you do it is with a lot of free writing and automated right automatic writing and just bleh, you know just puking it out and um so it's really practical it's really doing something to <laughs> do it but in the framework of being meditative Whew. That was a tough one to keep under an hour. And I didn't even cover everything that influences me. So for sure, that is a good, solid bibliography, though. Certainly a solid one. And you're welcome to try out anything I've learned from. And I hope you get the same mileage out of it like I did. So yay, yay love learning. And I hope you do too. Have a great day. Bye.